Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the session. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to have you join me here at KTH. Uh, a lot of people are here physically, but I know that we also have a lot of people that are listening in from all over the world. Uh, my topic is internationalization at KTH, uh, from student exchange to, to uh, comprehensive cooperation models. And uh, later on, the Vice President for Global Affairs will give a more strategic uh, perspective on, on the internationalization. So I would like to focus on a few highlights uh, during the development of internationalization here at KTH. Uh, we have a professor, Ramon Vuss, the former Vice President of Internationalization, who has contributed a great deal to this pr presentation. Uh, he cannot be with us here today because he it, is actually at this point in time boarding an airplane for China, uh, all in the name of, of internationalization. Um, at KTH, um, we've had an international activity for a very long period of time. Uh, research per se is global and crosses all barriers. Um, so there we have always had the international collaboration. Uh, but if we look at the educational side, uh, a more comprehensive effort began at the end of the 80s. And this was actually driven by the KTH leadership, by the KTH management. And it started with mobility and a few exchange agreements. We actually had our first agreements on student exchange with Europe and Australia. Uh, we also had a few agreements with the US. Um, but we had no information material about KTH in English, and now we're talking 1990. Uh, we had no courses taught in English, and we had only 50 exchange students. So it was a very modest beginning, but there was a um, very focused vision on, on internationalizing the whole education of, of KTH. Uh, after, after the mobility uh, had, had sort of started up, uh, we turned towards uh, looking at new ideas. Uh, we turned towards looking at uh, working with European projects. And in the year 2000, we actually initiated one of our first uh, international projects related to education. And that was within what was the predecessor to, to what is now Erasmus+. Plus. Um, it was an area within Socrates called Leonardo da Vinci. And um, a colleague of mine at another technical university, Blekinge, uh, Institute of Technology, a, co that a colleague there and, and I, we sat down one day and we talked about how internationalization needed to sort of penetrate the whole university. And we said that one of the, one of the areas where we do not have a lot of internationalization is actually at administrative level. So, so this project, IQ, uh, was actually um, put together to uh, bring home the, an understanding of internationalization to the administrative staff at our universities. And this idea was so new, so that there was actually no funding for that type of project at that time. But the EU Commission thought that this was such an interesting idea, so they set aside uh, a portion of funding for this, uh, for this project. And it was deemed to be such a success, so we were allowed to continue. And today, within Erasmus+, Plus, you have a whole funding area for staff mobility. And you have staff mobility weeks for administrative staff at almost every university in Europe. And that was actually started then in the year 2000 with this initiative from KTH and, and Blekinge. And this is a bit of what the program looked like. I'm, sure you can't see what it says, but you can recognize some of the, some of the areas that we discussed then way back. Uh, credit transfer, um, international exchange, mobility, etc. Issues that are still relevant today. 
we continued then with other international projects. Uh, Erasmus Mundus uh, was something which turned into a success story for KTH. Uh, Erasmus Mundus was a venture that was initiated in 2004. And the idea here was to create joint programs at master's level and PhD level between universities in Europe. Uh, in the beginning, KTH was a bit hesitant and did not really enter full force into the Erasmus Mundus. But in 2007, we got a directive from the KTH management that we should go all in uh, with Erasmus Mundus and really create momentum here. Um, we knew then that in 2009, the second version of Erasmus Mundus was going to be launched. So uh, we knew that we had two years to prepare for, for Erasmus Mundus. And what we did during these two years between 2007 and 2009 was to have a great deal of activity internally at the university, of course, but also uh, going to Brussels very often uh, to have contact with the commission to discuss discuss different alternatives. Uh, we also brought a lot of academic staff to Brussels to have an understanding of what this was all about. Uh, we had uh, workshops, we arranged workshops at KTH with participants from, from many of our European partner universities. There were about 70 or 80 persons present at these workshops and this did have a result. Uh, in 2009 we submitted proposals um, it was an all-time high. We had 16 proposals for joint master's programs and 11 proposals for joint PhD programs, which was, which was incredible. Actually, it was it was it was really amazing. And the results came. We handed in the proposals in April. The results came to us in July when you know in Sweden everyone is off on a holiday, and I got a phone call from the the people responsible for for the applications, and they could tell us that that you know, we had a very good result. We had a participation of 12 in 12 Mundus programs where we coordinated six, which was an immense challenge. At the same time, a great joy, of course, but it was an immense challenge because this was an undertaking that we had never had before at KTH. And it involved all different par uh, departments, uh, both at administrative level, but also many different academic apartments, departments. So, so talking about, about creating an impact and creating internationalization through the whole university, this was really a success story. So the question there, has this made an impact? The, the answer is definitely yes. Um, I would also like to mention our international networks, our university networks. Uh, KTH has had a long history of collaborating with different networks, within different networks. We see this as a very strategic decision to, to participate in certain networks where we get to know our partners really well and where we can join forces where research and education is concerned. Cluster is one such network. Cluster is an old network. It was created already during the, during the late 80s. And it, it has really been a success story uh, working within the cluster network. And sorry, I said a late 80s. It was founded in 1990. I have my notes here, so keep it correct. Cluster consists of 12 universities of technology in Europe. And uh, Cluster has had uh, very many approaches to, to internationalization. Uh, KTH had the, the honor of, of having the Cluster presidency for four years, between the years 2005 and 2009. This was at the same time when, when we entered into this Erasmus Mundus venture. And of course, many of our cluster partners were involved in the Mundus applications with us. Um, Cluster very early saw that it would be extremely interesting to participate in the European Institute of Innovation and, and Technology, the EIT. Uh, this is a major venture in Europe where we bring to together the knowledge triangle of business, education and research and form cross-border partnerships. Now in 2007, 
we got information from, from one of the advisors of President Barroso of the Commission that, that this, was, um, this was up and coming. So, so Cluster decided to apply to, to three uh, pre-proposals within the EIT, within transport, ICT, and energy. And we were successful in two of these three, in transport and energy. And then we decided, or Cluster decided, to have a concerted action where, where um, applications towards the real e EIT was concerned. Uh, KTH put major res resources into the application process and both applications that we participated in were successful. Um, and we have uh, two co-location centers at KTH. Um, did this always happen without, did this happen painlessly? No, not always. Of course, with 12 very strong universities with, with strong leadership and many wills and interests, uh, there's bound to be differences in opinion. But we see that the, the, the strength of the network is stronger than the, the individual strengths. So combined efforts do pay off, even though sometimes we have uh, conflicts of interest. And you can see here also where the EIT is concerned that on the first board, uh, 13 of the 18 board uh, members were, were proposed by Cluster. So it's, it's been a great success. And this is a picture of, of KTH, uh, from KTH campus where we welcome the, the inner energy uh, EIT venture to, to the KTH campus. Moving on then um, to, to another area. And this is a bit provocative, maybe. Shall I buy a BMW or study at KTH? This relates to the time when, uh, in 2011, when tuition fees were introduced in Sweden for the first time. And tuition fees were introduced for non-European or non-EU students. Um, up until 2010, there were no tuition fees in Sweden. All the education in Sweden was funded through taxes. Uh, but in 2011, like I said, the fees were introduced. Uh, we had already by that time had uh, quite a lot of tuition in, in uh, English, so this was not new to us. Uh, but we felt that, that now that the tuition fees were introduced, we need to step up and, and become even more international than we, we'd been so far. Um, tuition fees were a major challenge to, to Swedish universities. Um, it was a, um, a, a change of mindset that was needed at the time. Uh, we had never really worked actively with recruiting students, uh, international students, because since there was no tuition fee in, in Sweden, international students were naturally attracted to studies in Sweden. Uh, of course, also the high quality of the education was attractive, but but having no tuition fees did, did add to this picture. Um, and as you see, the tuition fees that were introduced in 2011 were fairly high, uh, 290,000 kroner for a two-year master's program, and then you have living costs uh, on top of that. So, so um, and you also see the figures that in 2010, where we had no tuition fees, uh, we had um, 2,300 applications almost to master's programs, where of about 1,500 enrolled uh, at KTH. So what happened in 2011? As you can see, in 2011, the figures dropped dramatically. Uh, and uh, we did not have a lot of uh, fee-paying students that were applying to KTH. And this, of course, we had expected that it would be that way, and it was, it was a sign to us that we needed to step up our recruitment activities, and we also needed to uh, see that KT, the KTH brand was made visible uh, globally. And this has actually resulted in, in a major increase during the past few years of, of students, so that of international students. So I would say now we are 
not quite, but almost back to where we were before the tuition fees were introduced. And we are, of course, extremely proud of that. And we are also very, very happy that the international students see the value of the education at KTH and even though we have the tuition fees, choose to study at this university. I'm coming to the end of my speech, but I would like to end with this picture because the heading here is each individual matters and has a story to tell. Uh, I think that Niraj Gupta is listening in actually on the speech. Uh, and Niraj is a perfect example of the big heart that our alumni have uh, towards KTH. We have a very large alumni body now, uh, international alumni body. Uh, we have a large number of, of alumni chapters all over the world and our alumni are very dear to us. Uh, Niraj um, completed his master's at KTH quite a while ago in 2004. Uh, he has now started up a number of, of companies. He is a real entrepreneur in spirit. And the reason why he chose KTH is, um, I, I keep on thinking of the movie uh, called Sliding Doors. Uh, what happens if you run to catch a bus or if you run to catch the subway train? What happens if you miss the train and what happens if you get on the train or on the bus. Um, those seconds can change the, the path of your life. And this is actually what happened to, to Niraj. Uh, he says himself, uh, this is an, an, uh, an excerpt from an interview with him, that he was sent uh, to pick up our former Vice President for International Relations, uh, Professor Ramon Vis. He was sent to pick him up. Um, in Delhi, because that's where he arrived. So we were sent by his professor to pick up Ramon Vis in Delhi. It was a drive of 300 kilometers uh, to Roorkee, to IIT Roorkee, where he was pursuing his degree. And during that drive, which took four hours, uh, Ramon Vis uh, talked to him about KTH, telling him about why the mathematics department at KTH was so, so uh, successful. And Niraj decided, based on those four hours, to, uh, to choose KTH for his studies. And he says that uh, that, um, that changed his life. And he has never looked back after that. And I would like to end with this, to say that the students, the alumni uh, that we have the honor of hosting here at KTH, uh, they are the essence of what internationalization is all about. And we are very, very happy and very, very proud to have so many international, um, international students and, and researchers here at our university. Thank you.